For years, the people of Millfield had gone about their accustomed tasks, making the most of their simple work-a-day life. Few surveying their calm demeanor would have dreamed of them in the roles that call for daring, life-making adventure. Yet on November the 5th, 1930, this community became the center of world news and the names of their dead and dying, the rescue by their heroes, and the bereavement of mothers, wives, fathers, sons, daughters, relatives, and friends held the heartbeat of the civilized world. Mine number six is located a short distance from Millfield, Ohio, in a beautiful Sunday Creek Valley, a part of the Hocking Valley coal fields. Mine number six is one of the large mines of the valley and at the time of the disaster in the fall of 1930, employed over 800 men and produced over 5,000 tons a day. My grandfather, Oscar Willis, um, had uh, several sons, but two of them worked in the mine with him, um, Andrew uh, and Virgil. Andrew was the older, Virgil was younger. Um, were in the mine uh, on that November um, in 1930, November the 5th, 1930, um, when the explosion occurred. Um, the family legend uh, was that uh, my grandfather Oscar and uh, the older boy uh, got to the the bottom of the shaft and and were waiting to be uh, taken up to the surface when they realized that the younger boy Virgil was not not among the group so they went back into the works um, looking for him and ultimately all three of them perished. The day of the disaster November the 5th 1930 dawned with the chilly autumn air. A great silver moon had kissed the quiet, peaceful valley and thrown over the hills of southeastern Ohio a spell of loveliness, tranquility, and sequestered security. Most of the men were in the mine before daylight. The day of the disaster was the day after election. George White had been elected governor of Ohio. Robert J. Buckley, United States Senator. The wet element had made great wins over the Anti-Saloon League, and Athens County had begun to slip away from the strong grip of the Republican Party. Thus were the men of mine number six happily at their work, some two miles underground, when suddenly disaster was upon them. With unspeakable swiftness, destruction and death rode through the working places of the men. I don't know, you, you kind of get the, the uh, kind of a numbness or something. The, it's not that you, do, you get insensitive, but you just don't, it's just hard to realize that everywhere you look, you, you look around through the, the, the camp, and almost every house was touched by death. Dark, slimy walls, twisted rails tied in knots during the heat of the inferno, falling ceilings of coal, mountains of it, scattered timbers and frames, then crushed, burned bodies of men, old men, fathers and grandfathers, young men who seem young enough to be boys, men and boys who but a moment ago were happily at work. This is the picture of a mine disaster and mine number six at Millfield. The Millfield disaster is both unique and dramatic in that several men who died in the tragedy were not miners, but were high officials of the coal company and other business people who had entered the mine to inspect new safety devices that had been installed in connection with the new air shaft. Eight men were led by the owners of Sunday Creek Mine number six. W.E. Titus, the president, and P.A. Cohen, Vice President, both of Columbus. Death came on swift wings to this group just as they were preparing to leave the mine. They were found near the shaft and one of the group had knelt over a toolbox in prayer. Nineteen survivors of the disaster who were taken out of the mine almost dead owed their lives to the good judgment of John Dean, who realized the deadly way of the black damp. 
and had the presence of mind to block it off with the Bradish. Rushed to the hospital, most of them lived, but a number were left broken-bodied men for life. A group of a dozen or more grim, grief-stricken Athens County miners stood silently by the air shaft of Sunday Creek Coal Company. A hundred feet below were dead or alive in a neighborhood of 100 of their buddies, friends, and relatives, waiting, waiting eternally for the slightest sight or sound or whether life might be left below. It was just about noon at East Millfield Elementary School, right after noon. The whistle began to blow, and our principal, she rang the bell, and we all came in, and we found out about the explosion at the mine. It was lunch hour, and we really didn't get all the children home or to some place till almost 5 o'clock that night, because there just wasn't any place to send them. The parents had all gone up to the mine to see, and we well, couldn't cross the road. The cars were coming. So we just sat there and tried to have some sort of order, play games. Of course, they were upset. My children cried, but I don't think they realized what was really happening. I was teaching first and second grade. Some of the mothers came for them, you know, but there just wasn't any place to send some of the others. We just tried to keep them inside because it was too dangerous. Ambulances and all kinds of things started to come in. I lost two brothers in the Millfield explosion, but my husband didn't get, they brought him out. That day, I saw my uncle coming and he said, sis, you go up to the mine shaft. I said, what for? He said, because the mine blew up. That's what you heard. I went in and got Billy. He was the only one I had then. I was cooking soup beans, doing my ironing, and I picked up Billy and I said, we're going over to the mine. When I got over to the bridge in Millfield, here come one of our good friends. He said, he's all right, don't worry. He's laying over there in the tipple. Just go on. He's up there. You'll see him as soon as you get there. Well, I went, and the first thing I saw was him, of course, because I was looking for him and his buddy he worked with was stretched out beside him. I knew he was all right because they both had cigarettes in their mouths. I knew they wouldn't be smoking if they didn't feel all right. Um, my grandmother was obviously devastated and, and uh, um, went, went to her bed for about six months is the way I was told. The kids were sort of parceled out to older siblings or to other uh, relatives uh, in the town. Uh, didn't talk about it. I don't, I don't think I ever even had a conversation with her about it. Uh, once that she was uh, able to uh, start taking care of, the, of her family again, um, that's what she just went about. She was a very sweet lady, but um, uh, was not, not something that uh, uh, we talked about. It, it wasn't a personal tragedy. Uh, it certainly was a social uh, and community tragedy. Um, but uh, uh, as, as far as me personally, um, uh, I certainly was not affected. Uh, I wasn't born until 46. Um, so it wasn't something that, uh, that, that blighted our lives. Uh, the other siblings um, went on to become uh, well-functioning, well-adjusted uh, adults and all had uh, careers and families and uh, the normal things that, that you would do. None of them um, appeared to have any lasting effect from the fact that they lost their father and, and two of their brothers. I, I can't imagine it didn't affect them, but it, it didn't show, at least I'll say that. Uh, one of the coming of age things in, in a little town like that uh, is that uh, you ended up getting a bike. And that certainly increased your range dramatically. Um, and one of the places that we would go to uh, was the, um, the old mine works, the mine tipple and the other buildings that were still standing at, at that time. And uh, well, it was strictly forbidden that we go there and we would have gotten a hiding if, if uh, my mom would have found out that we were there. But, we would ride over there and, and play on the, on the tipple. Um, they eventually tore it down because it, it was not safe and it was deteriorating 
but um, it was uh, it was a, a, a magical place to to play when I was uh, 12, 13 years old. My first reaction when I, I saw this was the, the number of people, although uh, everyone said that it was just cars backed up clear back into Millfield on both sides of the road and it was virtually impossible to drive there, you end up having to walk. Um, the second thing that struck me was the, the, how well dressed these, these folks were and how clean they were. And by that I mean they obviously weren't uh, just coming out of, of the mine after having rescued somebody or um, were not intimately involved in the rescue operation. They're standing there watching. Um, I, don't, I don't see a lot of women. Uh, there is a shot later, I think, of four ladies, but they don't appear particularly distraught. But for the most part, who, who I see are, uh, are men. And uh, of course, you can see the hearses that are lined up. Um, there's one of the rescuers there with the respirator on. Um, I don't know whether he's just coming out, obviously, or, or just, just getting ready to go down. Um, there's some more of the rescue guys going toward the, uh, the main hoisting lift. Um, so this could be uh, early on the 6th, uh, and I suppose it could be late on the, on the 5th. This is the, the company store, which was on the west side of Sunday Creek in, in Millfield. Um, the governor sent two companies of the National Guard in to kind of help maintain order and um, also in, in transporting some of the bodies uh, from the mine to the temporary morgues. This is the um, the coal, what we call the coal camp. Um, I'm not certain, this must be up toward the mine closer. Um, the, the, the company houses farther away tended to be two-story and in my recollection having been over there you know, on a paper route and different things most of those houses on that side of the town were two-story. I don't recall very many one-story. Um, there's some more National Guard gentlemen. Um, it's obviously pretty chilly. It's November. Um, one of the, one of the uh, accounts talked about snow, but I don't see any evidence of it, uh, evidence of it here. There's the main lifting hoist just behind those guys there. Um, I've, I've heard that it was a triple entry, uh, which means there, there could have been as many as three um, lifting hoists, but only one was called the main lifting hoist. These are some of the buildings associated um, uh, with the mine. Tipple is pretty, pretty simple. I do notice uh, what looks like some damage, which is directly over the hoist, that the rush of gas and, and, and smoke uh, may have lifted some of the, uh, the roofing on. Uh, they, they did go back down with, uh, with canaries because uh, some of the, the first people didn't have um, respirators. And because of the, the electricity was obviously disrupted throughout the mine, uh, they used the horses to to pull the cars that uh, they had loaded some of the victims on at some distance to bring them to the main hoist. Um, you know, this gentleman here looks like he's a member of the press. This was a grocery. Uh, it's called Stacks Grocery. The bodies uh, obviously being brought out. When I showed this to my mother, she was she was pretty. Showed, showed little emotion or, or, or any, uh, uh, any outward emotion until the, the bodies were brought out and that, uh, 
that seemed to affect her a great deal. And uh, subsequently, she's, she was speculating if that might have been her father or uh, one, of, one of her brothers. Um, while they, they lost three members of the family, there was one family that lost a father and four sons. So they were by no means the worst uh, struck of the people who lost men there. After the disaster, a fact-finding committee composed of state and federal miners and mining engineers was appointed to determine, if possible, the cause of the disaster. Reports were filed by the U.S. Bureau of Mines, Frank A. Ray, consulting mining engineer from Columbus, and an inquest by the Athens County Coroner of Millfield Miners working that day who survived the disaster. Since the lips of the fire bosses were sealed by death, it could not be determined what they had to report after inspecting the mine. The committee decided, however, that a fall of the mine roof bore the electric wires from track rails below, causing a short and setting off a pocket of gas that had collected. There are many theories, and unfortunately none contain ultimate truth. On Sunday, November 23, 1930, a memorial service in tribute to the 82 men was held at the Majestic Theater in Athens under the auspices of the United Mine Workers of America. Hundreds were in attendance, including relatives and friends of the disaster victims. Message of condolence were read from the governor of Ohio, the president of France, the German ambassador to the U.S., and the British ambassador. It was remembered that Germany was visited by a great mine disaster just a few weeks before that of Millfield, in which more than 200 lost their lives. Before the services were ended, on motion of Conrad Wine, Secretary of District No. 1 of the UMWA, a resolution was adopted providing for the perpetuation of the memory of these men by holding a memorial service each year. A most impressive and touching part of the memorial services was the roll call displayed on a screen while a choir sang an appropriate hymn. The following words were shown from the screen in memory of the men of the Millfield mine disaster who died. Their names we engrave upon our memory, their faults we print in the sands of the sea.